Welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is Monday, January 29th uh, in 1030 in the morning. And uh, we're very privileged to have for the first time um, on Rockstock Channel, a good friend of ours, Daniel Jimenez, who uh, runs ILI Markets, a consultancy. Uh, you may have, uh, if you follow Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, some of our friends' uh, podcasts, um, you know, Daniel uh, is a regular uh, guest there as he is uh, at various conferences that um, I and Rodney often uh, present at and sometimes are on similar panels with. Uh, Daniel, I um, actually, I, I listened to you for the first time. I didn't really meet. I think it was maybe 2015 or 2016. Um, it was at a Lithium Americas uh, SQM uh, event because uh, Lithium Americas had um, received an investment from SQM and you were working for SQM at the time and you were giving, you know, the overall market view back then. Uh, those were the good old days in uh, 2016. Um, and then I think we met in person in, in 2017. You had just left SQM and uh, we were at PDAC and there was all this, uh, you know, consternation going on in the Atacama with Eduardo Betran, um, or, or maybe it was 2018 when we when we first met and it had just, they, they actually just passed uh, the new concession. And I think you were arguing at the time that if you were SQM, you would very aggressively ramp up production, you know, as much as possible. Um, I've listened to you over the years. I remember in 2019 at the Deutsche Conference, um, you were quite pessimistic on pricing. Um, thinking, you know, a lot of us were more bullish that prices could be higher. You were pouring a bit cold water on that. However, uh, in December of last year, I was at the Deutsche Conference on a different panel listening to you. And you made a prediction that lithium prices this year could be around $35,000. And uh, Deutsche Bank, Corinne Blanchard, and um, the Benchmark Minerals rep, uh, they had twenty four and twenty five thousand dollars as their forecast, so their jaws, uh, you know, uh, seem to be dropping a little bit on on that, you know, very optimistic forecast. So um, we're all lithium bulls here, and would like to believe um, you are correct. Firstly, do you still believe that it's now, you know, about eight, six or eight weeks after that? Um, and if so, you know, we could delve into your, your your rationale. So if we could start with that. But before we do that, just want to remind all of our viewers, if you like this channel, please like and subscribe to YouTube. And uh, if you want some proprietary content, uh, consider supporting us on um, Patreon at patreon.com slash rockstock channel. And please follow Rodney and me on Twitter or X at lithium ion bull is my handle at Rodney Hooper 13 is um, Rodney's handle. And Daniel Jimenez is a very active uh, person on X as well. And he is at, uh, at D underscore Jimenez, J-I-M-E-N-E-Z. We'll flash this on the screen, you know, for that. And, and finally, please feel free to register your email at rkequity.com to make sure that you get our monthly newsletter. Before we start today's video, we'd like to thank Lithium Royalty Corp, listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, ticker symbol LIRC. We'll share more later in the video. So Daniel, with that intro, do you still believe lithium prices will get to 35000 sometime this year and, and when? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invite, Howard Rodney. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure and honor being here. Uh, yeah, look, the... the I mean, the, the question of Deutsche Bank was, what is a your optimistic price? Uh, yes, and I said, I, I could see 35. Um, what that number really is, is, is very difficult to, to assess. But, but what I would say in general terms, what, what, what I see is the lift in 2023 is a consequence of 2022. And essentially, when we, when we measure the two things we can really grasp in this industry, which is how much gigawatt hours were installed in, in vehicles sold. And that is probably today 80% of the global demand of lithium. And how much lithium was really mined. We would see that in 2022, there was a slight surplus. Yet prices went up like crazy. And, and what happened then is an enormous inventory was built up. So that was the demand we saw was, was actually the consumption plus inventory built up. 
2023, we saw the contrary. We saw what we saw as demand was actually consumption, less than inventory depletion. So in our math, what we see for 2024 is that that inventory depletion has probably reached a level where it cannot continue significantly. And yet consumption will be it will be grow more than uh, than what we see uh, supply growing, right? And therefore, we see a tighter market again. When will this start? How, how what level will it be? That that is to be seen. But what we also know, and that's also probably a, a, a strong fact, is that we will have certain swing production, and that swing production is primarily in China, and that swing production probably start at 20 and uh, from there onwards and, and probably through 30s. And, and then it also starts to stop when prices go, uh, go below 30. Huh? And you have a wide range of producers and, and with different costing tools. So that's why is that number, I mean, yes, we see tightness. We see that marginal cost producers having to start up again during the year. Um, will that end price be 25, 30, 35, who knows, but but certainly we will, at least in our math, we don't see that surplus that we saw in, in, in 2023. Okay. Um, the big question Rodney and I are hearing from everywhere and the big debate um, is China lipidolite and African spodumene, right? Because these were the, uh, were the big sources of new supply that came on stream in the past year or so um and what are their costs you know so when do they switch on or switch off and do they switch on and switch off based exclusively on western um you know profitability metrics right or are does china as a country or companies specifically like catl subsidize um this production um, in some way so that the, 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 the cost is, is maybe lower than um, the high end of the cost curve that, you know, we, we would argue, you know, would, would justify them switching off. Um, you know, so where at $35, it seems that like African spodumene in China lipidolite works, right? At $30, you know, maybe it works. $25, you know, we don't know. And there's also how much quantum of there is that even if, you know, they were to subsidize it, you know, what's the limits on production there? Yeah, that, that, is, that is correct. And, and, and again, here you, we will have all ranges of, 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 of costs in, 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 in this group of, of suppliers. But if we, if we go piece by piece, I mean, I think Africa, um, when we talk about Africa, I, I, at this point, I think we have to separate Zimbabwe from, from the rest. Uh, Zimbabwe is today producing a concentrate. The problem is, is uh, not significantly higher cost than the, the average Australian mines. So, that probably is, is, is not going to play a significant role in the difference, huh? in, in the changes. What will probably be, where we should see a significant reduction is on all this DSO, because it's actually mostly DSO which is being sent to Africa, from Africa to, or not from Africa, from other countries than Zimbabwe to Africa, right? Uh, and that is probably the, 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 the mineral which will be at the high end of the cost curve and, and, and reduce. Um, the view of Rodney, I would like to hear that as well, because he, he be, being there, he, he will have probably very good insights on that. Um, yeah, and on the Chinese lipidolites, we have lipidolites of 0.5% lithium oxide and others with 0.2. And with that means that you need to move to pro process, in one case, probably 150 tons of mineral, per ton of carbonate, and the other one 450. So the costs are very, very different between one and the other, right? Um, I do not believe that in the short term, yes, but in the medium term, um, 
Chinese will most likely, if they're not profitable, stop stop producing and, and buy cheap. I mean, at the end, even CATL wants to make make, make money here, right? Um, and this we have seen in the past, uh, going back many many years, uh, the whole Chinese lithium industry has stopped when 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 Atacama came into play. Um, yeah, and, and 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 this will happen. I mean. The economics in the short term, you can you, you can try with subsidies, you can try with state-owned control productions to to maintain the operations, but I don't think they're going to be too long, right? So I think bottom the line, the head there, Daniel, that's this is where the entire lithium debate seems to center on: is can Chinese lipidolite not only stay in production around these price levels but actually expand and that's that's the debate because if you've cut back on spodumin like you've seen with igo signaling and some of the others are probably going to cut back it's going to need to be lipidolite that's going to step up to make the difference and that is the debate i am with you i don't understand how 0.25 0.3 can survive at these prices but there are those that believe that so you know at what point does continuing to subsidize or or the the state or cross subsidies within integrated um battery players etc at what point do they risk threatening another major undersupply if they subsidize for too long and and development slows down on on all the new projects you're right you're right yeah again i i think here this um the cost curve will operate uh, at the end of the day those who claim to have lower costs will will really feel their prices and uh and make the decisions i would think a lot of bigger impact in this whole supply demand uh, scenario is what companies like like SQM, for the sake Talisman can do, Pilbara can do. Um, I think that is significantly bigger, at, 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 and where the bigger variance is, I think, in in our models today. Uh, can SQM produce forty thousand tons more next year, or this year in twenty twenty four compared with last year? I think they can. Is that in the models? Could, if the market turns quickly, green bushes again produce again, uh, operate at a higher rate? Those are all things which um, which are probably more incidental in, in, in a supply demand balance than what we could expect from Africa, or even from China, when we're talking to have prices between fifteen and twenty five dollars. So, so I think I think uh, yeah, we we need to to keep. A, not to blind ourselves or, or, or to, to meet with the lights of Africa, with the lights of China, and look also with the other countries. And then, evidently, then this on the demand side, the other big uh, debate, I would say, um, in general, the market or all the analysts globally are very bearish on electric vehicles. And um, and yeah, the, evidently, with with Western companies, uh, Western OEMs doing bad. Um, because they're really facing the Chinese competition, or, or they know they will have to face it without being able to compete. Yes, they're, they're giving bearish outlooks, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that the industry as an aggregate is, 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 is going to be that, that, that bad. Um, when we look at the, the sales rhythm China has achieved over the last four or five months, and you extrapolate it through 2024, um, I mean, China will be probably uh, easily reaching 11 million vehicles next in 2024. That's alone 3 million vehicles of incremental growth. Last year, global growth was 4 million. Right? So again, here, here uh, a lot of focus being put on whatever incremental supply can be coming from Africa or from, or from China. And probably we need to also not to lose sight of the other things which could be very important. I agree with you on the uh, brownfield supply from incumbents, and I do want to talk a bit about you know SQM and their expansion uh, potential. Uh, but you're, you're right, green bushes can grow. Uh, IGO said they're committed to CGP three, uh, committed to, and when they actually implement that is another story. But there's there's, there's a lot of supply 
uh, from Brownfield, you know, out there. We, we all care. You're you're involved in Galan, and there are other, you know, junior developers out there. You know, when we look at the lithium market, we see, you know, long-term projections. I think Albemarle still has 3.4 million tons in 2030. And Pilbara's most recent um, quarterly results that they're using similar uh, benchmark uh, numbers, um, you know, for that quantum. And even benchmark and others are, are saying that we're at a risk of uh, supply shortfall, you know, if not in the next one or two years, certainly, you know, three, four years from now. But when you think of uh, SQM and West Farmers, uh, you know, that can grow. You know, SQM, you know, in Azure and Hancock, you know, new discoveries have been made. The, the, their, uh, you know, Wajina is gigantic and grow. Um, you know, green bushes can grow, but it's constrained by the joint venture philosophy that they'll never sell spodumene, right? They could sell spodumene, they could change their mind, but they're not selling spodumene. So they view the world through their hydroxide conversion. And both of them are having struggles in Western Australia. And even in some cases in, in China, we hear both Tangxi and Albemarle um, and tolling is very expensive. So decisions to cut back, you know, on the best mine in the world, uh, are, 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 are not spodumene based, they're hydroxide conversion based. But there's a lot of supply that can come from these discoveries that have been made. And then um, SQM, let's delve into that. Uh, you know, in 2018, uh, a heavily negotiated a, a agreement with Corfo, it, it gave them a higher quota expectation. I think it was a 210,000 or 240,000 a year. Uh, but they gave them a short time frame, you know, within 2030, they had to do it. So that incentivized SQM to very aggressively ramp up their production. I remember they went from like 50 to 150 to 180. And now I think they're at 210. You were just suggesting can SQM increase 40,000 tons this year? I'd like to understand, you know, how, how is that? Um, is that possible? We understand like they, they the MOU you know, Cadelco gave them an extra 300,000 tons of their allocation, which will enable SQM to grow, uh, but they still need to invest, we've heard, um, like a billion dollars, uh, maybe we're wrong about that, in order for SQ, and plus they need to get permitted, further permitted, I think, uh, in order to grow just their Atacama uh, tonnage. And then separately, they have this sulfate um, strategy, you know, which, which seems to be from like waste stockpiles. So if you could explain to us the, the state of play of SQM and the, the, their ability to grow production and also just what's their relation with the government. And it, it still seems the government's not too happy with SQM or, or looking to throttle them or restrict their success. Yeah, look, the, the, the SQM, um... The, the contract which, which is in place today with Corfu, that contract calls for a production sales quota actually through 2030, which enables SQM, and that was, I think, the plan to produce up to 240,000 tons per year, right? And, and with that, eat up the quota through 2030. This 240,000 tons were essentially, uh, essentially 210,000 tons of chemicals produced in, in, in Chile and 30,000 tons of sodium sulfate, or lithium sulfate, sorry, which are refined in China, right? So with that, SQM reaches those 240, and if it produces 240 year by year, it will end up eating the quota it was granted in 2018. And that was the forecast. Um, and um, my understanding is that SQM has today that capacity already. Okay. So when we look at SQM sales, and we will have them probably in, in a couple of, of we'll have them in a couple of weeks. Uh, SQM probably last year sold 160, 170,000 70, tons of RCE. Not significantly more, I think. So there is potentially. SQM could go to 240 in, in an extreme. Right? I don't think it's going to be that, but it could be a very significant growth of supply of sales. Right? Uh, 
that is with regards to to uh, that is my short term doubt. This this what is SQM going to do this year, 2020? When we look though at now at the agreement with Codelco, that agreement you have to separate in two phases, 125 to 2030, and then the agreement is essentially that SQM gets 300,000 tons of incremental sales quota, right? But from those 300,000 tons, um, Codelco will draw the margin of, I don't have the number in my head, but let's assume 90% of that, right? So essentially, SQM should, if the base case was to produce 240, should go to 290 as of 2025, right? And, and that the, the margin of those incremental 50,000 tons, they will go to, uh, they will go to Corel, to Corel. So we think SQM is going to go to 290,000 tons, maybe not, not by 25, but, but definitely by 26. What does SQM still need for that is incremental refining capacity, which are modules, which probably they will try to fast track permitting for that and construction is also relatively uh, easy at this point in the sense that it's it's modules which you add to to, to the existing capacity. Right? So that is to me the scenario of Corel of, of SQM Corel. SQM and Corel are going together to produce at least 190,000 tons, uh, probably starting 2026, uh, 27. And we understood that the, the capex for that would be about a billion dollars, um, but a billion dollars divided by 60,000 tons is only 16,000 dollars you know capacity or dollars uh you know for incremental ton which is substantially lower than any other project you know throughout the world but uh so so is that estimate accurate you know sqm would have to invest a billion dollars yeah no i i would think that the capex is lower than that huh? because uh, uh, they will not need to build incremental uh addition and concentration capacity because they're going to use the existing capacity, but they are going to, uh, they need to build refining capacity, and that capital intensity is probably $10 or less per kg of annual capacity. I would think that it will be closer to 600 million capital to, for these expansions. Okay. Um, we, we understand that, um, you know, from 2030, you know, SQM will essentially only have a 15% economic interest in the Atacama. Is that your understanding? That given all the royalties they need to pay and now th this deal with Cadelco? Um, yeah, I haven't made the math, uh, but, but essentially uh, SQM will have roughly 50% of the economic interest after royalties. Royalties will largely depend on prices and it's because it's a sliding scale. Yeah. So if royalties go up, prices go up significantly uh, yeah royalties will be uh, very high if prices remain at twenty dollars i think royalties something like four dollars per kilo something like that um no i i think for, for the the economic interest of we have made it modeled it and, and it could be a wrong whatever but we estimate that the economics uh the present net present value of the flows sqm will draw the cash flow SQM is going to drop 2031 onwards. Brought in today, we estimate it to be five billion. Uh, so, 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 um, and for the Chilean government, in the range of the 30 billion. So it's one sixth, if you want, of, of one seventh huh? of, of the total. Okay, which so that, that's about 15. That's about 15 percent. Yeah, yeah um, you're right. Yeah. Okay, so if. It's just a weird animal, you know. Some people are optimistic, you know, SQM or whatever. Like, but it seems like the Chilean government is really squeezing them. But nevertheless, SQM. I, I, I try to understand the um, the rationale of uh, you know a CEO. You know, in, in Chris Ellison, he's a founder owner. Uh, I understand his motivations. Um, you know, Xiao Shen, you know, and, and Mr. Lee at, at Ganfeng, founder owners, I could understand, you know, their logic. If I look at Kent Masters and I look at Paul Graves managing, you know, U.S. capitalist kind of enterprises and, and thinking about the world, um, 
and, and you know they get salary bonuses, RSUs, etc. You know, but Ricardo Ramos, I just I don't like fundamentally understand like what motivates um, behavior. You know, on SQM's point of view, like like they, they seem to be squeezed out of out of comma. You know, but they could make more money potentially. Obviously, it's higher capex and more risk. You know, in Western Australia, but the the Chilean government's not like in their business in Western Australia. You know mucking around with their economics in the way that they are in the Atacama. So what's the incentive for, uh, you know, SQM and Ricardo Ramos to really, you know, massively invest and grow? It is the best resource and they do have the capacity there, but the, just how, how do they think about those things? The first thing is you have to think that the base scenario is that 2030, you go home. But 2031, at first you go, 31, you go home. That was the base scenario. So whatever they would get after, uh, with the negotiation with Coleco was already uh, positive, uh, uh, would have been positive. And that's, I think, what they achieved. Now, if you think it also, from a practical point of view, compared to the base scenario, which was to go through 2030 and then go home, from now to 2030, the agreement is neutral for SQM. Neutral. So everything they get from 31 onwards is their present value, is value. And, and essentially, the, the SQM, what did it achieve or the, for SQM Shell or Ricardo Ramos in, the, in his negotiation? He achieved that uh, the, the, the cash flow would be uh, would generated, will continue beyond 2031. Uh, um, and Yes, SQM, re, SQM shareholder who today own 100% of the flow cash flow they have today. Now that from then onwards they will get 50% of the cash flow of the same cash flow they would have, would, uh, which is in theory available today. But I think there's also another upside to this, uh, Howard, which you also need to incorporate in, in, in this analysis: the the potential that Atacama can produce more, more than the 290,000 tons. And without without having um, y using DLE technology, right? And that could be the case. That could be the case. I mean, we have worked with with geologists who know the Atacama fairly well, and and they believe that that can be achieved, right? So maybe that production of Atacama is not 290 long term, but it's 350. If all this what they call, uh, what is it, Atacama Futuro or something like that? Um, Alaya Futuro. Alaya Futuro, yeah. Alaya Futuro. If they really achieve to get some DLE technology to work and they get fresh water up there, yes, it could be. It could be even more. But but I think there is a big potential for an upside as well, so that from SQM shareholders' perspective, it's not only now 50% of 290 or so 145,000 tons, but it could be 50% of, of, let's say, 350, right? So there is a lot of value. Uh, I, um, I I personally was actually surprised for the terms SQM got. Huh? I, I found it a very good negotiation for SQM. Okay. Um, but, that's what I want to say. Okay, but but the but the Solar Futuro um, that is a requirement from 2031, you know, and beyond, right? It is subject to, you know, so this um, what you just suggested is not the base case um, if the MOU kind of goes through, right? They, they 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 would need to use some DLE technology to to grow beyond the 290. I do I, I do not understand that it is a precondition for it. That it could improve, improve production later on, yes, but it's not the precondition to continue operating as they're operating today, right? Mm -hmm. Again, I see this as as basically neutral for 2030, and yes, 31 onwards, it's only 50% of the cash flow they, they get today. That is to put it in in, in, in simple. Okay. With an upside uh, that the production is higher. That that fifty percent is worth more than what it is in this two hundred and ninety thousand tons production. Jumping in here from the editing room to tell you about Lithium Royalty Corp. 
Lithium Royalty Corp is at the center of a global energy transition and manages a globally diversified portfolio of lithium-focused royalties in electrification and decarbonization. With 32 royalties on 29 higher-grade, lower-cost projects from exploration to production, LIRC covers all the bases with well-managed risk, ESG considerations, and a scalable royalty structure. Lithium Royalty Corp is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange ticker symbol LIRC. To find out more, visit lithiumroyaltycorp.com. Okay, there, there are a number of bears uh, in lithium for years, like outside the lithium industry, who always just look to the Atacama and said, lithium's not rare, and Atacama is gigantic, and you know SQM can just expand, 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 you know, so uh, projects outside, you know, <laughs> of that are, it's a waste of time, right? Chile politics has gotten in the way, you know, a fair bit over the years, which has enabled uh, competing lithium sources to come to market. Uh, and, but you're suggesting that this, it, it could grow to 350. It's not limitless, right? But if it's a it's if it's a 3.4 million ton market in 2030, you know, they would be 10% of supply if they got to that 350 that you're talking about. Uh, still plenty, you know, available for for others. But in the, in the short term, there, there are risks here that uh, low cost supply from Atacama may, may uh, come to market and keep a lid on, you know, prices. Uh, getting to that optimistic, you know, kind of 35,000 that, that you said is a, is an optimistic case. Uh, with respect to Western Australian M&A, which we saw last year, uh, prices were going down, but there was a lot of optimism still that, okay, if you're having Gina Reinhardt and Hancock and Minrez, you know, and SQM and Albemarle strategics, Putting money into hard rock in Western Australia, they must be smart. That they must have you know, long-term uh, understanding in the market. But if I break down the various players there, you know, Albemarle number one walked away. Uh, how they misread the market earlier in the year compared to how they, they, I can't imagine they would put a three, four billion dollar you know price tag on something if they thought the prices were going to deteriorate. You know, as they have in, in, in the second half. So I just I question. The skills, you know, at Albemarle and other players in predicting the markets, um, and then Gina Reinhardt, Hancock. The dollars of investment in lithium are tiny in, in comparison to what she was used to in spending in iron ore. I think Roy Hill was a ten billion dollar project. So, you know, so her strategic thinking, you know, I, I'm not so sure that I, I. It really means that the lithium market is um, is, is fundamentally undersupplied based on her decision making. And then uh, Minrez, you know, Chris Ellison, he, he announced that he's land banking. Um, he's making it up as he goes along. You know, he just did a billion dollar bond. So for all of those strategics, you know, activity, I, I can ding them, you know, but SQM, on the other hand, has always been very conservative. And when they came into Mount Holland, they invested, I think, 130 or $150 million to acquire 50% of that project. And here they are, and, and then that had a resource that had scoping study, I don't know if it was at PEA or, or, or PFS, you know, here we have Azure and, you know, pre-resource and they bid, I don't know, like a, a billion, billion and a half dollars. So that that's very aggressive for a very conservative company like SQM. So I view it optim as an optimistic data point, you know, so you and some of it could be negotiation um, and, and out of common, they need diversity. But how do you read that, you know, Azure? And we also understand that SQM has been um, financing, you know, multiple other projects in Western Australia. It's not just this. They And Azure, they found, actually, they got a 20% stake at a very low valuation before they um, invested significantly more. Uh, any insight you can give to us um, about a real strategic, you know, and their view uh, of hard rock supply, you know, not just their great Atacama brine? Look, when when we think about SQM and Atacama, yes, until recently it was a, a, a story which would have ended in 2030. So SQM has a, had a strategic need to, to look elsewhere. 
And and besides that, and, and that you, you always need to be aware, brines will always be the lowest cost lithium resource, and that there's no question about it. But um, but you cannot even if you have enormous brine resources, there is a limit to much how much you can produce on a yearly basis from a brine resource, which is not the case from a mineral resource, right? Atacama can be 20 times bigger than anything else, but yet you, it's limited by the amount of lithium you can extract from Atacama on a on a, on a yearly basis. Right? What, uh, rem remind us why that is, Daniel. It's because of the hydrogeological balances you need in, in the salt flats. Uh, you need to maintain the, the environmental equilibrium there, and it's a basin where you have water flowing in, and it flows out through evaporation. Now, if you start, start evaporating more than what flows in, the, the water table goes down, and then you produce all, all type of environmental impacts. So that is the limitation for a salt flood, and that is all across uh, all salt floods, right? So, so everything in salt, Argentina, uh, uh, that applies to everything in Argentina as well? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. To any salt flood, right? So, so, uh, so the size of the resource doesn't really matter in salt flats. What really matters is how much you can your net extraction of brine is possible. So that was one image. Now, why is SQM going to Australia? Evidently, it's looking for for opportunities. SQM is probably too risk adverse to go to Argentina, and that's why at one point it was in Argentina, it left Argentina, and and Australia has been has been worked fine for them. Um, I think the 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 the, the Joint venture with West Farmers is probably very complementary. You have the the if you want the the lithium mining uh, skills of SQM, and you have uh, and refining, and you have a partner there who is a powerhouse, a local powerhouse, right? Um, in the case of Azur, it was also a, a early stage discovery for SQM. Uh, it appears to be a very good resource, and that's why SCAM was willing to, to, to jump in in a bigger way. But I would say, all in all, the, the big players, and here where we talk about Almemal in particular and, and SQM, uh, they have a long-term play. They need they know they need to have assets which can uh, survive a short uh, or the low price uh, cycles. And... and Yes, maybe the devaluation of of, of, of of Lion Town was very high in the case of Albemarle, but look, it's the same we thought, me included, when they bought Wujina. When they bought Wujina, I said, wow, these guys are crazy. What are they doing with the price they paid at that time? And you might remember, right? Yeah. Uh, ended up being, I think, a very good investment for Albemarle. So um, we cannot... Uh, judge this as being a bad decision during the low uh, price cycle. We need to look at this over a longer period of time. And um, the same for SQM and Asur, right? Uh, do, do you have any <laughs> line of sight of of what's happening at Covalent? Because uh, SQM said that they were going to be selling spodumene from that this year. You know, last year they said that. Do you think yeah. they're going to follow through on that? I have not heard anything on the contrary so i think i think um and I, I guess the first thing is to see production what the quality is if i would be sqm i would probably try to have a tolling agreement rather than than a selling of spotty mean but again this well, let's hear what they have to say i i, I don't know really I'm not sure anything. Mm -hmm. The tolling agreement just for one year, you know, until yeah. the, their own hydroxide plant is built. That's a possibility. Yeah. Why not? And they are that plant's fifty thousand tons, like at once. That's that's coming on. Yeah, stage one is fifty thousand tons. And that's huge, two, right? Considering how much struggle, you know, Kemerton, you know, is only now commissioning. I don't know how many years late, you know, and Tangshi Quinana. You know, any do you have optimism that that's going to um, come on stream with a uh, little limited problem, or you know, are, are we going to see another Kemerton or Quinana, you know, situation there? 
Look, it would surprise me if uh, West Farmers and SKM have not learned from from the mistakes of of Ademani and Tianqi, uh, and I've asked them the question, uh, and and they, they they are more or less aware of what the problems were in in in, in those two project executions, right? Uh, that gives that is another reason why I would rather instead of selling spotting, I would rather toll lithium carbon into hydroxide lithium, uh, because if the ramp up of the refining is slower or you encounter any problems. This will not be a one year problem. It will be a two or three, right? So it's mm -hmm. better, in my view, for an SQM and also for West farmers to start from the day beginning to, to operate lithium hydroxide or, or, or carbon in whatever they're going to produce. I would recommend them carbon at this stage. Yeah? Do you know much about SQM's other exploration activities in, um, WA? No. No, I do not. Do you think they'll um, look at other geographies like Quebec, you know, following, um, you know, Ken Brinsden, I think that's another, you know, positive data point from a long-term perspective, um, you know, for him to be moving his family there. No, not that I'm aware. The, the thing is, which is a fact is that SQM has a big uh, exploration and M&A team in Australia today. Mm -hmm. um, and I've not heard, and I might be wrong, that whether they're working in other geographies. Huh? But uh, I think they have, um, yeah, they're, they're a strong team in Australia. So I would presume they're going to continue focusing on Australia. Yeah. Okay. Rodney. Then we see um, the land making progress going a specific route with the lithium fluoride, raising some, some capital. Um, I guess uh, one has to uh, make a call on when we're going to come out the other side of this market. Can you give us a sense of where things are at? It looks like it's it's progressing well. Yeah, no, Galan, the project is progressing well. We are we are constructing a phase one of our lithium chloride production, um, and actually the the. We're starting, we started already filling the first pond uh, last week, I was told. Uh, so the, pro the, the project is moving along. Um, I think we have done a good job at de-risking it uh, significantly. Um, we have a very strong technical team in place uh, from geology, hydrogeologists through process, uh, process, uh, engineering and construction. Uh, and, and actually, the construction work is moving along very quickly with a very experimented uh, construction company, which has built, uh, I think, uh, several hundreds of square kilometers of, of solar operation ponds. Uh, so we are progressing uh, uh, stage one very, very quickly, and we hope we hope to get the permit for stage two on time, so that we can have a continuous construction operation. This should enable us to have already lithium chloride concentrate uh, during the first half of 2025 of stage one and the stage two uh, capacity already in production by early 2026. So that is the situation today. And um, yeah, we're very, I would not like to say confident, but I, I, I think we are have uh, most of the of the risks have been mitigated significantly, so it, it's I think a very solid project. The salt Ombre uh, Muerto is also a salt flat, which is very forgiving in the sense that it is a very homogeneous brine with very little contaminants. So um, also from an operational point of view, it's, it's less complex than operating other salt flats uh, in Chile or, in, or Argentina. And Daniel, just in terms of um, the marketing and sale of, of phase one, and then, you know, if you ramp to phase two, is that contingent on on marketing again domestically or just, just fill us in on that? Yeah, we're working on two fronts. Huh? The one is, is to, to well, that's our plan A, to get, a, to get finally the export license. And, and if we do the, get that, which we're working on, and I'm optimistic that we will eventually get it, um, that will open up a significant possibilities 
to to export this lithium fluoride concentrate uh, yeah, to several geographies uh, just across the border in Chile or to to Europe. China evidently is always an option. Uh, so so that is plan A, and it, it it is something which is not new. It's something which SQM did for ten years, um, and it were it and and it's from an operational point of view very efficient. And parallel, we're working uh, domestically with, with, with in, within Argentina. Some of the producers who who, who will probably need um, feed of concentrate for the chemical plant, and we're also at this stage also negotiating a uh, calling agreement for a dedicated lithium carbonate plant in Argentina. So we're working on the, on the sea fronts for the time being, and uh, whatever. Is better for us. That's what we're going to do. And and just broadly, the timing on 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 when you on the uh, export license. Yeah, th that could be uh, within within the next, I would say, three months, four months is probably what we're going to define that at the time we need to 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 have clarity on that. Yeah. So it looks good. I'm honestly thinking it's, it's going to, to come through and, and it will be a good thing for, for, for Galan evidently, but also for Argentina, because I think conceptually it also makes a lot more sense, even goes, if it goes against the general uh, thinking there, it makes a lot more sense to execute these projects quickly and to produce lithium chloride concentrate and have the concentrate refined close to the consumption centers and not to have to bring tons of reagents up to the Argentina and Pune and, and, and refine that there. But again, here it's something which, which boils down to economics and, and, and that's what's, what we are going to try to uh, convince authority to give us those permits. I mean, today, uh, who can process lithium chloride globally? China could obviously do it, but who could take lithium chloride in 2025, 2026. Who could take? If you think about Albemarle on the other side of the Andes, has 30,000 tons of idle capacity today. Uh, in Argentina, I'm convinced that we will also see similar things. In Argentina, we will have around 12 projects producing uh, over the next three years, three, four years, three years actually. Um, if you look at until not too recently, there were only four projects in South America, four operators. Two of them were not capable, able to have sufficient lithium chloride concentrate. So if that relation maintains, it could essentially means that probably from this 12 in Argentina, we'll have four, five that will need lithium chloride concentrate. Um, and that is, is again, as, as they start to ramp up, they will, they will face reality and then we'll know who, who, who might need it, might need it. Uh, but you, you, you but think Arcadium, know. Arcadium and, uh, you know, Minera XR, you know, Ganfeng um, can take the lithium chloride and Albemarle could take it and, and SQM just within South America. Not to yes. mention, you know, the Aramets and the other projects yeah. that are uh, ramping up. Actually, yes, because the, the Hombre Muerto brine is a very clean brine. And as, as I told you earlier, very little contaminants. It has very little magnesium, very little sulfate. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that means that if you feed that into a plant and even blend it with brine, with concentrates coming from, 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 from the resort, from other resource, it improves the recovery of, of the aggregate, right? So it's a very desirable uh, blend to put into a, 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 a lithium carbonate plant. That's uh, something we have experienced with the discussions we have had with, with different operators, right? Um, because it's a very clean, uh, clean concentrate. Okay. That's uh, and that's not exclusive of Galan. I must say that's also the case for all the all the operations in Hombre Muerto. This is Hombre Muerto. Huh? Fosco will be enjoying the same Alchem alignment as well. Okay, and we just have a, a minute or two left, Daniel. Um, if you, looking at the landscape of uh, lithium 
development or producing projects all around the world today, if you had fresh capital today, right, this question of, okay, buy low, sell high, we're in a pessimistic, you know, point of view. Um, at the moment, right now is a great time to start buying stuff. Uh, Galan excluded because you're a director and, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think you have been buying on the, <laughs> an insider buying, but when you look at the universe from Western Australian spodumene producers or developers to Quebec, you know, or North American hard rock to sediments in Nevada to DLE plays um, anywhere in the world, you know, oil field brines or, or otherwise, or, you know, Argentine or South or, or Chilean. Uh, actually, in Chile, it's really just producers. There's not really too many explorers there. But like, if you were to like look at the landscape, who do you think are going to be the winners? You know, within a one and three and five year time frame, w w where you would put fresh capital to work. And I forgot to mention African spodumene as well. You know, mm -hmm. in that mix, how would you rank them in your uh, investment idea? Yeah. Here, here you have to 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 combine low uh, the trade-off between low cost and speed of execution huh? so on the low cost end i would definitely go for companies with assets in brines uh, who have already a development uh, or, or a, a brine or, or basically uh, close to production and here to leave out galan but but to me, uh, what, what Alchem uh, or Live are going to do is is probably very attractive in, in the long term. Um, so I would look definitely at brines which can be executed in a reasonable uh, time frame. I like Australia. Uh, Australia is a jurisdiction where you have the whole ecosystem working in favor of executing projects quickly. You have first of all money. Secondly, you have the the resources. Third, you have the know-how, right? So Australia, to me, um, and there in Australia, even you can start at an earlier stage because ex project execution is, is relatively quick. I like Brazil. Brazil is, has also proven that uh, they have sufficient big, uh, good resources. The project can be executed in a reasonable time frame. Sigma is an example of that, right? So I like Brazil. And, and to be honest, that's where I would put today my, my, my coins. Huh? I'm more skeptical of North America in general. Uh, I would say the US because of the resources, they are not so high grade and they require many of them new technologies which are not proven. And, 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 and so, so you will have hiccups during that, that process and delays. Canada, on the, uh, and, and not to speak also in the U.S., uh, on, on, on permitting. Yeah? Permitting is an issue. And then Canada, on the other hand, permitting is also an issue. And uh, it's cold in Canada. It's very cold in Canada. So and, uh, for some people, that's not a problem. But, but uh, I, I, I guess it's easier to do that same thing in Australia than in Canada. Uh, yeah, and Africa, it's something I... Don't know sufficiently to to give an opi an opinion. Uh, we have talked with Rodney before and, and about Africa, and yeah, he, Rodney has a view which is probably m far more interesting than mine. What I could talk about Africa. So that's why I would say, I would say, uh, Brian's Australia and Brazil is today my my top pick. Understood. Thank you. There's uh, on the RK Equity scoreboard, there's any number of Argentine brines, uh, South American hard rock and uh, Western Australian hopefuls. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you very much for that, Daniel. I forgot to mention your wonderful, uh, you, you do when you tweet, you know, have some great charts, but the w one that's gotten, you know, a lot of popularity, I forget exactly what, you know, all the interrelationships of all of the companies and the projects. Uh, if you can um, maybe send that to us, we could flash this up here. Um, it's just grown and grown and grown those interrelationships. Um, but uh, yeah, you could look up, you, you could look up Daniel again on Twitter and uh, follow ILI Markets. Uh, really appreciate uh, your joining us today, Daniel, and look forward to having you back sometime later in the year, hopefully in uh, 
more bullish times and, and maybe we'll, we'll reach your optimistic uh, price point of uh, $35,000 sometime this year. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Thank you very much okay. for both of you. Take care. Bye-bye. All right.